Here's a segment from a recent Gun Talk Radio episode. You can listen to all the Gun Talk Radio podcasts however you tune in, or check out guntalk.com for more. My impression is that we're doing okay in the courts. And this week we got a real big bump and and a case that uh, I want to talk about where it's basically restoring constitutional rights to millions of Americans. Whenever you talk about gun rights and court cases and legal scholarship about the Second Amendment, one name pops up among the top guys all the time. And, you know, there just are some people that it's flat out just fun to talk with. Don, Don Kilmer is one of those guys. He joins us right now. Don, how are you, sir? I'm doing good, Tom. How are you doing? Well, I am well. So, all right, we get this. I didn't want to steal your thunder. What happened with the first cir- uh, the Fourth Circuit rather this week? Uh, well, we got a decision out of the Fourth Circuit uh, that, uh, first of all, let me say, is a very well, clear, written opinion. You don't always get that sometimes from judges because lawyers sometimes struggle with uh, judges' writing styles. But this is something that uh, any person with good reading comprehension and a fair understanding of, uh, of the Constitution, you don't need to be a lawyer, a legal scholar, or even a Second Amendment scholar, you can read this opinion and understand all of the judge's uh, arguments and mm-hmm. op- and uh, legal reasoning for this ruling in a case called Hirschfeld versus the ATF for the proposition that the eight that the Second Amendment protects the right of self defense and the right to keep and bear arms of people eighteen to twenty one. And the reason this is important is the 1968 Gun Control Act said that if you're 18, 19, or 20 years old, you cannot buy a handgun from a licensed dealer. Yeah, and that was that was one of the uh, things that the court kind of pointed out in its reasoning was that the GCA, the Gun Control Act of 1968, drew this distinction between 18 to 20 year olds being able to buy long guns and 18 to 20 year olds being able to buy handguns. Mm -hmm. But the court looked at was some of the historical record of um, of the 1968 Gun Control Act, where Congress basically debated, uh, although they provided scant evidence, that the reason they made this distinction between handguns and long guns for this narrow group of 18 to 20 year olds or 18 to 21 year olds was because of juvenile crime, Hmm. which was a big issue in the 1960s. But primarily what Congress was targeting was the unsupervised acquisition of handguns and the violence that they that they thought flowed from that. Of course, fast forward 50 years, and we know everybody who's purchased a gun knows that we do not have unregulated buying and selling of, of guns now, regardless of whether it's a shotgun, a rifle, or a handgun. Right. Everybody is subject to a background check. Everybody is subject to filling out forms and providing, um, uh, you know, identification and a form of ID. Everyone is subject to all of the rules and regulations, not only at the federal level, but oftentimes at the state level. Right. And so the court took a look at the original justification and said, well, Congress really doesn't meet its burden here for distinguishing. But the, but the overriding rationale of the court in coming to its conclusion was that the Constitution itself and federal statutory law uh, identifies 18 to 20 year olds as not only eligible for, but as a category of people who serve in the militia and who serve in the military. So the court reasoned that it's not, it's not, it does, it kind of defies logic uh, and mm-hmm. common sense to say mm-hmm. that people 18 to 21 years old can go off and fight our wars and possibly be handling, you know, anti-tank weapons, as well as rifles and handguns, <laughs> right. and to say that that, that that group is somehow unvirtuous or suspect uh, just because of age. And so the court did this long analysis and took a look at, at con- congressional evidence. They took a look at uh, the text history and understanding of the Constitution at the time it was ratified, and again, when it was applied to the state's when the 14th Amendment was ratified and said there's just no evidence that that Congress or the people who run the government, us, you know, we the people, right. um, decided that 18 to 20-year-olds do not have a right of self-defense. And so 
Once it came to that conclusion, the court then turned to the government and says, now it's up to you to justify why you want to exclude these people. And the court came to the conclusion that the government had not met its burden and therefore, so, um, and therefore so, struck down this law. Right. So basically what they said is, look, you as a citizen of the United States, you get your full citizenship and all your rights at age 18. It's not like you get most of your rights at 18, and some of them are going to hold on to them until you get to be 21. Well, well, well. It, it, it point of fact, the only the only uh, age limit for exercising rights in the Constitution, we find it in several places, is there's an age limit for being a uh, you a representative, like a congressman uh, in the House, and you right. have to be 25 years old. Okay, you have to be 30 to be a senator, and you have to be 35 to be the president. Now, but those are rights for holding public office. The only mm. other place where there's a a, a, a restriction on a right is the right to vote that we find, and I think it's the oh, I, I'm going to get uh, yelled at by my students here, but I think it's the 24th <laughs> or 25th Amendment that 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 lowered the voting age across the country, in, or at least for all federal elections, to right. 18. Okay, and this comports with the idea that 18 is a is an age where People under the United States Constitution acquire their political rights, the right to hold, the right to uh, vote, the right to sit on a jury, uh, the, the your uh, you know your obligations to answer the draft, um, you know, and in and in most places that's also the age for consent, for uh, ah, uh, sure. marriage, for uh, um, entering into contracts, uh, and and all sorts of um, and all sorts of issues. In fact, if if the um, when, when the court's winding up its opinion, it kind of concludes by saying, "Look, if we were starting from scratch, okay, mm -hmm. maybe there's an argument uh, that that we should wait uh, for you know passing this this right of of possessing deadly weapons until you're more mature. Maybe there's scientific evidence that says your brain is not fully developed until you're 25, and 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 that sort of thing." Right. But it says that the history history makes clear. And this is what's critical to why this decision is, in in my humble opinion, as a constitutional scholar, so well done. It says that history makes clear that eighteen to twenty year olds were understood to fall under the Second Amendment's protection. Uh, those over eighteen were universally required to be part of a militia near the ratification and proving that they were considered part of the people who also enjoyed Second Amendment rights and most other constitutional rights apply to this age group. And there and Congress had failed to connect handgun purchases from licensed dealers to youth uh, gun crime under the GCA, right. and that uh, 18 to 20-year-olds uh, have full, fully vested Second Amendment rights. The lawsuits that Second Amendment groups file in various courts around the country, federal court, how are we doing with all that? We're talking with Don Kilmer. He is a law professor, a Second Amendment scholar, and he follows this kind of stuff. In fact, he's been involved in a lot of these suits. So, Don, I mean, I, I know this Fourth Circuit case is important where 18, 19, 20-year-olds now can purchase handguns, at least in the Fourth Circuit. I'm sure this is going to be uh, probably go be appealed to Ambach and then maybe even to the Supreme Court, right? Yeah, well, it's, it directly conflicts with a Fifth Circuit case, uh, uh, National Rifle Association versus uh, BATF from about uh, about a half a decade ago. It came to the opposite conclusion. So this this is going to set up that circuit conflict that maybe the Supreme Court is going to want to take a look at. But mm -hmm. you okay. are correct that for for now, the decision only applies in the Fourth Circuit, um, um, which is uh, Eastern Seaboard. Uh, and a couple of uh, states inland from the eastern seaboard. Um, now there is a distinct possibility that it it would be there would be a petition for en banc review, which is where the entire Fourth Circuit looks at it, and they have the opportunity at that point to overrule uh, the uh, three judge panel. Uh, right. It was I mean it was a split decision. It was a two one decision. Right. It there was, was a, very, a very very spirited dissent. Yes. Yeah, um, but it, I mean the, 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 you know. I, I, since I agree with the majority opinion here, I, I'd like to criticize the dissent. The dissent basically is is trying to rely on on social science evidence and 
right. and these uh, uh, psychological and, and, theories of, of you know when brain when when, when uh, young people um, you know sh- should be authorized to purchase and own deadly force. But I mean, you could extend that argument to well, then maybe you should you should be 25 before you can drive, or maybe 25 right. before you can vote. Right, exactly. So where are we generally? We've got dozens and dozens of lawsuits throughout the country, all over the place from different groups on Second Amendment fronts, and it seems to me we're making some progress. Yeah, I'd say I'd say we're batting better than 500 at this point. Uh, we're winning some and losing some, um, but you know that seems to be highly dependent upon location. So it's almost like the real estate market, you know, location, mm. location, location. So right. if you're in if you're in the Ninth Circuit, uh you're definitely you have an uphill battle. Um if you're in some of these other circuits where the um the makeup of the court is a little bit more a little older, a little bit more conservative. And and it seems to me too that there's a there seems to be a uh an increase in the um in the quality of representation too. The, the lawyers who are taking these cases are doing a deep dive and taking the issues seriously. And that's that's what we really want from the courts, too, is the mm. courts are starting to take this seriously, too. Uh, that's one thing that this this decision, as, as I read it, as a, uh, a scholar and looking at it, it's very heavily footnoted. It, it takes a look at the congressional record for evidence. Um, and so, um, you know, it, what, what, what you want to have happen is for the courts to take the take the right seriously. And unfortunately, up until Heller and McDonald, and even after that, the courts, and I'm thinking mostly about the Ninth Circuit here, right. uh, just don't take the right seriously. And they they seem to kind of treat it like the redheaded stepchild of, of the Bill of Rights, and, mm-hmm. and they really don't want to like, do a deep dive into some of the evidence that's available. Question for you. I mean, I, in my you know, feeble brain over here. I keep thinking maybe our, our the golden BB in this whole thing is to get the Supreme Court to say yes, Heller was correct, and you cannot ban guns that are in common use, as the case we just got out of California. And yeah. in other words, you cannot. There's no such thing now as any ban on any gun that's in common use. Would it? And what I would like to think is that if we get that kind of a ruling. A whole bunch of gun control laws just go away. Am I imagining yeah, this? No, you're not. You're not. And what's interesting too is that a lot of the, what in my opinion, were wrongly decided cases get automatically sort of called into question. So, you know, even the cases that we've lost in the Ninth Circuit, uh, if we get a U.S. Supreme Court decision that gives us a definitive ruling or a standard of review that conflicts with those older cases. You know, it's it's going to be easy enough to file the serial numbers off of there, or file the case numbers off of these old cases and just refile them. <laughs> Nicely done. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, here's the thing. You know, when when I teach the Second Amendment, I try and and you know, because when we teach Heller, the, one of the big issues in Heller was does the does the preamble of the prefatory clause of the Second Amendment control the second half? You know, the, right. a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Does that control the right of the people to keep and bear arms? But when I, I go one step further. To me, the preamble of the Second Amendment and the First Amendment and the Fourth and the Fifth and Sixth is really the the uh, beginning of the Constitution that starts, we the people. Mm-hmm. It, you have to remember that the purpose of the government is to protect the rights. So rights come first, and then comes government. And the purpose of government is to protect our rights. So when we say we the people, you know, we do establish and ordain this constitution, it's we the people saying, and by the way, we have a right to keep and bear arms, and we have a right to free speech, and we have a right to be Mm -hmm. free from unreasonable search and seizure. So that's the preamble to all of the constitution. Uh And that doesn't, and that isn't limited to people who are over 25 or people who are live in a certain area of the country or people who uh, are of a particular political class or a political party. It means everybody, we the people. Exactly. And as we move forward these cases, and they are moving forward, and we have a, a Supreme Court that we would like to get a lot of these cases to as quickly as we can before the makeup changes, I am keeping my fingers crossed that we could get some rulings that basically make a lot of gun control laws go away. That would be a, a brave new world for us. Um. Uh, yeah, I don't. 
I don't I don't disagree with your with your analysis there. Uh, I mean, first of all, one thing, even the cases we're winning on, uh, and, and we saw this in Heller and McDonald too. The courts are are not saying that uh, it's it's uh, deuce is wild. They're 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 specifically upholding laws that say, yeah, we can, we we can enact laws to keep guns out of the hands of violent felons, and right. we can enact laws to keep guns out of the hands of of people who have uh, been diagnosed with a mental illness, and we can keep guns out of the hands of people who. Uh, who've been dishonorably discharged from the military. So there are still regulations that, you know, I, I don't think you're going to find very many people that want to disagree with. Okay. The right. problem we're facing, the problem we're facing is that uh, the the anti-gun, uh, you know, efforts have been to try and classify keeping and bearing arms as inherently dangerous. And those of mm. us who are around guns all the time know that they're no more inherently dangerous than your car or a hammer or an axe or a baseball bat or your fists or feet. Mm-hmm. And it's, it comes down to, uh, you know, you pass a law making it illegal to commit murder or armed robbery, that should be enough. Right. Exactly right. Don, I just want to thank you for the time you spend here, but also the time you, you spend working on this. I know it is uh, a passion and... I don't know that it actually makes a lot of financial sense for you, but I very much appreciate you being at the top of the heap when it comes to Second Amendment scholarship. Well, you know, if I if 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 I if I make any contribution at all, it's because I stand with and on the shoulders of giants like you know Dave Copel and and uh, and Don Cates and uh, and you know Dave Hardy and, and a lot of the people who write law review articles and litigate these cases as well. So there's. There's a, there's, it's, you know, I can't, uh, I'm part of a team. I understand. Well, I, I'm glad you're on the team. And look forward to seeing you uh, soon, my fellow Idaho resident. Oh, yeah. Hey, you're just an hour north of me, so we're, we're going to have to uh, uh, have to drive north and uh, take a look at your lake up there. Sounds good. We'll put the team together there. 